So we're back again with more extrusion force testing. This time I want to take a little look back at some of what we did before and try and diagnose what was going on. So in the last episode when we were testing Revo, we saw a lot of ripples and we saw it actually in the first episode as well. It seems to be like, although the overall force kind of looks constant, it's kind of going like this the whole time. Why is it doing that? So the ripples, where the hell are they coming from? Well, it looks like, like provisionally, if we just look at the data and see what's going on, it looks like they're going at a consistent time period and that that time period seems to change with the flow rate. So when the flow rate's low, they're kind of slow ripples, but when the flow rate's faster, that kind of all compresses into a shorter period of time and then they're much faster. So does that kind of have a pattern of some kind? Is it predictable? So the first thing I did was look at five millimeter cubed per second flow rate and counted the number of ripples, the time it takes for those ripples to occur, and therefore work out the time period of one ripple. So at five millimeters cubed per second, we get 16 ripples, which took 10 and a half seconds or 10,500 milliseconds. So you get one ripple every 656 milliseconds. Makes sense. So seven millimeters cubed per second, 20 ripples, 9.4 seconds. So every 470 milliseconds. I think the best way to work out if there is some sort of pattern is to try and predict a different result. So if we try and predict the 11 cubic millimeters per second with both the five and the seven cubic millimeter per second data, we can see if either of those is gonna line up. So using the five cubic millimeter per second data, we take the 656 millisecond time period, divide that by the new flow rate, which is 11, and then multiply by the old flow rate. So basically multiplying the whole thing by five over 11, which is the ratio of the flow rates. And that gives us 298.2 milliseconds. So that's what we're predicting will be the time period of a single ripple at 11 cubic millimeters per second. Let's take a look with the seven cubic millimeter per second data. So we take 470 milliseconds and then divide by 11, multiply by seven, which is the ratio. And then we get 299.1 milliseconds. So 298, 299 milliseconds is pretty close. That's looking pretty good. Question is, is it actually correct? So 298, 299 milliseconds is pretty close. That's looking pretty good. Question is, is it actually correct? So for this 14 peaks takes 4,175 milliseconds. You divide that out, 298.2 milliseconds. <laughs> so just by using a load cell attached to hot end, we've worked out or just can correlate between these ripples and flow rate with one millisecond of precision. What? <laughs> that is insane. The question is what is actually causing it? We know that it corresponds to flow rate. So it's probably either like extruder, stepper motor, something like that, something that's pushing the filament, which changes the flow rate. So let's carry on. Let's dig a little bit deeper and see what we can find. So in order to find out what is really causing the ripples, we first need a value which we can compare across all flow rates. So something that's always gonna be the same. We know the volumetric flow rate is obviously not the same. The speed therefore can't be the same, but the cross-sectional area is. So if we take our flow rates and convert it down to length by dividing by the cross-sectional area and using the frequency, we should be able to get a period or pitch rather of the filament over which this feature repeats. So if you imagine a wheel kind of rolling on the ground, if there's like a bump on the wheel, then every time you roll the wheel, it will create like a set length on the ground at a certain interval. And that's what we're finding, but like on the filament in the extrusion. So if we convert our flow rates first to speed, we divide by the cross-sectional area and then multiply by the frequency of the ripples, we can find that these peaks or these effects or events or whatever is causing the ripple is happening every about 1.36 millimeters of filament. This doesn't sound like it would be the filament itself. If there was an error with the filament, like a problem with its dimensional accuracy this consistently, it would probably be over like a much larger length. The other thing we can look at is of course the stepper motor. Now that has 200 steps, full steps per revolution and like a whole load of micro steps in between those as well. So if we were getting a rotational effect from the stepper motor, I think it'd be far more often than 1.36 millimeters because those features are really very, very small. So I'm gonna kind of Skip over that for now, we'll come back to it if we need to though. The other thing of course, is the kind of gearing in the extruder. Is there something in there that could be causing a problem? 
Now, I know that E3D Titan is fitted, but we're talking about the clone extruder, which I've had fitted up until this point. Obviously, this testing has already happened. Like, I'm just talking about it now. So when looking at the extruder, I think the best place to start is the point where the filament contacts the gears. Like, those drive gears, the clone drive gears, the dual drive clone gear system, which is actually doing the pushing of the filament. So to find out how the gear teeth are actually engaging with the filament, we need to understand the effective diameter or effective radius, which is basically the point or the distance between the middle of the gear where it's rotating and the point at which it meets the filament with zero relative speed. It's not quite the tip of the teeth, it's not the base of the teeth, it's somewhere in between. So we just measure that diameter, divide it by two, and we'll call that the effective radius, although it's a little bit off. The other thing we need is the number of teeth. Now, the key that teeth that are driving are obviously different to the ones that are actually in contact with the filament. Those are the ones that are like the other end of the uh, dual drive system. And on there, there is 17 teeth. So they both have 17 teeth, they interlock and do the pushing. So we're kind of, what we're kind of trying to find out here is if you imagine a wheel with like paint marks, 17 teeth, 17 paint marks around the wheel, and you roll that wheel across the ground, what's the length between one paint mark and the next. So to calculate the pitch, we just take the effective circumference and divide it by the number of teeth. So the circumference is pi times the diameter, which in this case, the diameter is 7.41 millimeters. The circumference is therefore 23.28 millimeters. And we take the pitch, 23.28, divided by 17, the number of teeth, and we get 1.37 millimeters, which is blooming close to the 1.36 millimeters that we were looking for. I don't know about you, but that seems way too close to just be like completely circumstantial. There's no way, is there? So the way the dual drive gears are interacting, the period at which they interlock and apply force to the filament is actually having a quite significant, it seems, effect on the actual extrusion out the hot end, or at least on the force that's being applied. But it doesn't really end there, does it? Because all we've really found out is that our clone extruder is not very good. Is it dual drive systems that are just terrible and ruining our prints? Or is it just clone extruders are rubbish and you shouldn't bother buying them because they ruin your prints? Hmm. Huh. 